Now, don't let that worry you, because that's really not going to, as I say, that's not going to worry us. What I want to do today is I want to talk about potential, start us off talking about potential energy surface. And what that potential energy surface means to me. And to me, where, why shouldn't we start with the most simple case? And the most simple case is the hydrogen molecule. So we have a H atom separated from another H atom. In fact, we're really not talking about atoms, we're talking about nuclei. And we're going to separate those at a distance r. Now, what you will have learned last year, in intermolecular force of very other various other courses, spectroscopy courses, is that we can look at what is the energy of that molecule. And we can measure the energy of that molecule, the actual energy in, uh, relating to the electrons of that molecule, and we call that energy the potential energy of the molecule. And we can plot the potential energy on our y-axis. And given a particular bond length of the H2 atom, we can plot that energy as a function of that R distance. So I can do an electronic structure calculation, something very similar to quantum chemistry calculations that you learnt about last year in computational chemistry, and I can obtain that potential energy at various distances and plot that curve. And most importantly will be the minimum, the lowest energy structure. And if you remember from last year, that lowest energy structure is the most important to us chemically. It's going to recur again and again. This very, very lowest energy structure, the minimum energy structure, uh, the minimum energy, is where the forces in the molecule are all equilibrated. There's the force on one hydrogen from the other hydrogen is nullified. They are at rest. They are at equilibrium. The force, or the, the, the slope of the potential energy surface, is zero at that lowest <coughs> energy point. A very, very important point called a stationary point. <coughs> That's one, this point here, this stationary point, the minimum energy uh, point, is going to be very, very important when we now move on to polyatomic molecules. Now, what else do we know about that surface? Well, we could join the dots. We could join the dots, and we could say, well, there we go. There's our normal bonding state of the hydrogen molecule, H2 molecule, the one sigma 2 uh, state. Now, what else is important about this course? Well, this course moves on, and it says, well, a bit like photochemistry, if you're not always interested in the lowest energy of a molecule, sometimes we're interested in higher energies of a molecule, where we've excited the electrons, an excited electronic state. In this case, for the hydrogen molecule, there's not a lot of places we can excite the, the electrons to. We can move them into the antibonding state. And if we do that, and we do a calculation, we find actually that the molecule is never bound. There is no minimum energy distance on that blue curve. In fact, if we excite a hydrogen molecule into this excited electronic state, it will just fall apart. The energy will come down and down and down and down as the molecule dissociates and moves apart. So one way of splitting hydrogen is simply to excite electrons from their bound state into the excited uh, antibonding state. And these two curves, the ground state and the excited electronic state, are going to be quite recurring themes in some of our chemistry. So for the hydrogen molecule, everything is going to be very, very simple. Now what did we learn last year that, that allows us to go forwards? Well, I know you've all, you've all done a little bit of photochemistry, but here's a slightly different way of, of the way in which I present the uh, excited potential energy surfaces. And there are some key words here. The first is you can see now the ground electronic state. Well, first of all, let's have a look at what are our axes. Again, our y-axis is the potential energy of our imaginary molecule. And our x-axis, now, I've, I've used the coordinate r, but this coordinate r now is not a bond distance. It's a collective set of coordinates that describe the shape of our molecule. So the collective set of coordinates that describe our reactants are shown by this vertical dotted line here. So these are our reactants. And moving across, we can have a collective set of coordinates r, which define our products. 
we tend to describe these collective coordinates r as a vector usually written as a bold r a bold character indicating that it's actually a vector of coordinates for every single atom in the molecule and we'll see that in a second So what else have we? What have we got on that on this on this uh, diagram here? Well, we've got our ground state that we plotted before. That's this bottom state, the ground state, and that's the normal state. That's the normal potential energy surface that we associate with normal room temperature uh, or fairly low temperature chemistry. That's what we call the adiabatic state. It's like it is the ground state of a molecule, but it's adiabatic. This word adiabatic means, as far as we're concerned in this course, continuous. There's a continuous path from reactants through to products. All on the same electronic state. So it's a continuous change of the electronic structure of the molecule. As the, as the nuclear coordinates move, as the molecule changes shape, the energy smoothly goes from reactants to products. So the distribution of electrons will go smoothly from reactants to products. We can also say that for the first electronically excited state. In the first ex electronically excited state, I've drawn schematically here in this is the red one. And notice that that can have quite a different shape to the ground electronic state. <coughs> it has, in this case, because this is just a, a, a schematic an example, it happens to have a minimum where, where there is a maximum on the ground state. But that doesn't have to be the case. It could be anywhere. It quite often is. And in fact, this is exploited by the chemist Femter second chemistry of Zavail, where he got his Nobel Prize for actually trying to identify a transition state, because this is actually quite a common feature in a lot of reactions. But I want you to realize that one thing very important that's going to recur as we go later on in the course, towards the end of the course, and I talk about some things called diabatic potential energy surfaces, I want you to realise that the adiabatic states here, notice these surfaces don't cross. You can't, the, there's always a gap between them. There's always clean air between these surfaces. They don't overlap and intersect. And that is a very big feature of adiabatic potential energy surfaces. And the other aspect about this is we can, of course, have more excited states excite the electrons into higher and higher excited energy levels. But particularly, we, can, uh, we might want to look at the first few electronic states. They may be very close together. And when they're very close together, you'll find that they have some very un unusual chemical properties. And again, we're going to study that a little later on, because you can actually get these molecules, as they do the, uh, perform a chemical reaction, they can jump from surface to surface. And that might happen a bit later on. So this is where we're going. And where we're going to start today is in our understanding of what is the Born-Oppenheimer potential energy surface. And what does that mean for us in terms of energy and energy transfer? We're going to study the Born-Oppenheimer potential energy surface. So where do we start to study the Born-Oppenheimer potential energy surface? Well, we start with the Schrodinger equation. We would have had a piece of paper. So I haven't got a diagram of this. So I haven't got a diagram of this. Okay. Let's start with the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation is often written, or time-dependent, independent Schrodinger equation, like this. Now, you were introduced to it, I'm sure, in many different classes. What does this equation mean? Well. You're now at third year level. You shouldn't run away from this equation. It's actually a very interesting equation. The H is actually what we call an operator. It's a mathematical description. And in our case, because we're studying molecules, and we're going to look at molecules, it's a description of the interactions of the electrons and the nuclei in our molecule. Because after all, chemistry is all about the nuclei and where the electrons go around those nuclei. So the H is a mathematical formula which describes the potential energy of the interaction of those 
electrons with electrons, electrons with nuclei, and nuclei with nuclei. Now the phi here, now this is our molecular wave function. Our molecular wave function, and what is a molecular wave function? A molecular wave function describes, at any particular time, it describes exactly where, or the probability, of finding the nuclei wherever they are, and the electrons in whatever distribution they are. So it's just a mathematical concept, a function, which we can write out explicitly, telling us exactly where we would expect to find the electrons and the nuclei at any particular time. Now you might ask, why don't I just cancel those two off? Well, the problem with cancelling these two off is these are not what we could just normal numbers. <coughs> these are functions. These are descriptions. And the mathematics <coughs> of these functions does not allow us to cancel them out. So this is something like, take the derivative of that side, and it will equal a number times whatever function you had originally. That is a typical, what we call an eigenvalue equation, similar to the, to the Schrodinger equation. And you can see how if I put dE by dx, if I had dE, sorry, d of psi by dx, I could not write that as, sorry, d of psi there. Yeah, let's say I had that equation. You can immediately see why I can't cancel out the d by dx with the 3.4. One's a number, one is a mathematical concept. I cannot cancel those out. And that is the essence of the Schrodinger equation. Now, what are we interested in? This wave function phi is the molecular wave function. It describes everything. So let's write it down. Let's write down what we mean by it. Now, what, one approximation that we will have to make is that we're going to have what's called the electronic wave function, and we're going to multiply that by what we call the nuclear wave function, N. N for nuclear, E for electronic. E for electronic means for the electrons. N for nuclear means for all of the nuclei in your molecule. And we can write down a formula which tells us where the electrons are, independently of a separate function telling us where the nuclei are. We can formalise that, and we can formalise that by telling us what these functions are functions of. Now, the electronic wave function is a function of where the electrons are. And again, I'm going to use this collective little variable r, lowercase bold r, saying that's, the, that's it like a vector telling you where all the electrons are in space. So that's the position of the electrons. And I'm going to have a big R telling me, now that's where all the nuclei are. Because, not surprisingly, the electrons will follow where the nuclei are. They will orbit around the nuclei. So I cannot see these two independently. The position of the electrons depends also upon the position of the nuclei. But what we can say is that when we look at the nuclear wave function, the nuclei do not care at all in our Born-Oppenheim approximation as to where the electrons are. So our nuclear wave function can just be a function of where the nuclei are. And remember that this tells us everything we need to know about the nuclear properties. Now, remember, think, you might be thinking, well, that's not of interest to me as a chemist. What are nuclear properties? Well, nuclear properties are anything that involves the position of the nuclei. So what sort of things depend upon the nuclei positions, but not the electrons? Give me some ideas. Think laterally. What properties, in spectroscopic properties, do you know that actually tell you about where nuclei are, not about where electrons are? Well, let's start with a simple one, infrared spectroscopy. Vibrational spectroscopy tells you where the nuclei are. It says nothing about electrons. It tells you where the nuclei are in a particular environment. So this nuclear wave function is going to tell us about infrared spectroscopy. It's going to be the energy of vibrations in a molecule. So if with that little hint, you'll start to also see that this description of the nuclei also tells us about how molecules rotate. Microwave spectroscopy, infrared rotational vibrational spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy, and I can go on. So when we talk about rotational energies, 
translational energies of molecules and vibrational energies of molecules, we're really talking about where the nuclei are. When I talked about electronic surface, born oppenheimer potential energy surface, what is the electron energy of the electrons? Where are the electrons? I'm talking about the electronic wave function, describing where the electrons are. So by assuming this, this splitting here, by assuming that they're separate, and the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, we can do that. And we can do that because the nuclei are about 2,000 times heavier than the electrons. So when an electron moves, a nuclei is so heavy it essentially doesn't feel the electron moving instantaneously. Eventually, it'll notice the electrons are gone, and it'll move around, it'll move to compensate. But instantaneously, which is what the time-independent Schrodinger equation is all about, notes this disparity of masses, and notes that the electrons must follow the nuclei, and not the nuclei following the electrons. And this is a very, very important first consideration. This is our Born-Oppenheimer Approximation. So, our R are the nuclei, nuclear positions, and the R are the electron positions. Now then, what does this imply? Well, mathematically, what does this imply? Well, this implies that the energy, or the interactions, this H Hamiltonian, which is the Hamiltonian is a description of the total energy. It's, a, it's a, a physical concept which says, how do you calculate the total energy? Now that implies, if I split these two up, that I'm going to have, I can write a description of our interactions of the electrons with the electrons completely separately to the interactions of the electrons with the nuclei. And we can also note that that will also be completely separate from the nuclei interacting with themselves. And so this H plus H plus H will also imply exactly the same thing about the energy. It will imply that the energy of the molecule is the sum of three independent terms. And that's very important. This is an instantaneous concept of that, that your molecule will consist of three independent terms. Now, in reality, this isn't quite right. But we'll come back to that a little in a few minutes. So what else now? Where does that take us? Well, this formalism, if you read through your more detailed notes, this will take us on to the next step, because the next step is, where does that take us? Well, it takes us to a very important concept, that, that we can now write the Schrodinger equation into two different <coughs> separate <coughs> equations. And the first one is that the electronic energy is given by a Schrodinger equation, which is dependent on all the interactions of the electrons. The electrons with themselves and the electrons with the nuclei. That multiplied by the wave function telling us where the electrons are. What must that equal? Well, that must equal the energy of the electrons plus the energy of the electrons interacting with the nuclei. I can put EE there, if you like. Times, and again, <coughs> it's a, an eigenvalue equation. So we have this very, very simple equation. So we have the descriptions lead us to the fact that the, we're going to get an energy that is telling us the energy of everything to do with the electrons. And similarly, we're going to have another equation, set of equations. And these are that the nuclear Hamiltonian will tell us explicitly where the nuclei are. What's the distribution of a nuclei? So the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, nice fancy word, is really just telling us what you probably already thought. Most of chemistry can allow us to separate the motions of the electrons and their behavior from the motions of the nuclei and their behavior. But it's a very formal proof that provided that, they, well, since this discrepancy of the mass occurs, we can consider chemistry in two completely different uh, equations. Now, when we solve the top blue equation, this is what you learned in quantum chemistry last year. This is telling us about the energy or potential energy of the molecule, 
This total here, E plus E, here is telling us about the potential energy of the molecule because it's telling us about the electrons. It's giving us the molecular orbitals. In fact, this phi E here is often written Need to write this down. Two, three, three. Okay. This is what's called a Hartree product. Now these little phi's here are your molecular orbitals. So phi one is the first molecular orbital. Phi one with a bar on top is the first molecular orbital with an electron having opposite spin, beta spin. This will be the second molecular orbital with the third electron in it. This will be the fourth, uh, the, the next molecular orbital, which again, that one should have opposite spin, having electron number four in it. So we've got four electrons in the molecule in two energy levels, uh, two electronic energy levels. This is what's called the Hartree product. It doesn't quite work. Those of you who go on and do uh, the other course in this, uh, the other theory course this year, will find out that actually that has to be what's called anti-symmetrized. It's not quite right as a direct product. It's actually got to be a determinental product. That's a mere detail. The point is that I can write down this electronic description of where all the electrons are in terms of a product of the molecular orbitals, those things that you're all so familiar with. So you do already know this. So you could multiply your molecular orbitals together to, to get what this, this actually is here. So this is all just a bit of jiggery pokery. So this is quantum chemistry. This is really where the title of the course came about in terms of electronic structure calculations. And that really is the extent at which I'm going to talk about the theory of electronic structure calculations. The whole point of this course is not to study this equation in any detail, how you do it, but what are the implications? If I gave you a computational chemistry package, you could calculate the energies, you could calculate molecular orbitals, then what are you going to do with them? And that's the topic of the course. Now the other part, important part of the course, is this second equation. What do we do with the second equation that's telling us about nuclei? What's that going to mean for you as chemists? Well, the bottom line is that that second equation in this course means the following. It means, well, this one implies that the nuclear energy is going to equal the energy of the trans of translation plus energy of vibration <coughs> plus the energy of rotation. There it is. That's what that second equation is going to imply for you. There are, in fact, you can treat them separately. You can treat the harmonic oscillator model and get the energies of vibration. You can use the rigid rotor model and you can get the energies of rotation. We'll see a bit later on. You can use the particle in a box and you can get the energies of translation molecules. So this is going to be part of our course. This is going to be very much part of our course. How do we put these two equations back together to do some reaction dynamics, to, to look at chemical reactions? When we can split them apart and treat the energies completely separately. So let's let me put that into a diagram for you. We mentioned adiabatic reactions. Here's the diagram. Not focused. I try to summarise that in a diagram. What is this course about? Where are we going? So, we know about now the Born-Oppenheimer surface. This bold, adiabatic, meaning it's the lowest energy, it's continuous, it's continuous, it's a continuous potential energy surface. This bold bottom line here. Now, this is where my warning to you all by email last week that uh, my notes that I handed out to you today, the packet of notes, is the, con is the, are the type of notes you might want to walk away with at the end of the course if you had to revise it not understanding a word I've said. However, 
if you want to annotate during the lectures, the Blackboard has a set of all of these slides there for you to print out. Now, protocol means that I can't give you all of these stuff, um, but I think I, I took a decision that the printed full notes, which contain everything you actually need, this is there somewhere in the packet. Well, it'll be there somewhere in that packet of notes. Everything is there, but you just might have to search for it a little unless you use the actual other notes. Okay. I know it's confusing, but that was the decision that, uh, that I took early on. Now, we're talking about the bottom line. The question that I want to ask you is, and that's the energy that we get from an electronic structure calculation from solving the Schrodinger equation. That energy, potential energy E here, is the potential energy, the electronic <coughs> energy. So what does that mean for in terms of our chemistry? Well, what do we know about chemistry? We know that molecules have a zero point energy. Every molecule has its own individual zero point vibrational energy. It cannot have no vibrational energy. So when we start a chemical reaction at zero Kelvin, no temperature whatsoever, at zero Kelvin, we don't start the reaction at the bottom <coughs> on the potential energy surface. We start it a little way up where that dot is. We start it including its zero vibrational energy. And since every shape of a molecule has its own individual zero point energy, that means that our, ch our chemical reaction at zero Kelvin must follow some way above the potential energy surface. Now that's an interesting idea because you're all taught about just the potential energy surface. Now we're talking about well, real chemical reactions occur just above the surface, in adding in their zero point energy. So we've already added in some of the nuclear energy, because then some of the vibrational energy from that other equation we have to add in there. What else do we have to add in? Well, most of the chem uh, chemistry you're interested in is at bigger than zero. T is bigger than zero. So how are we going to add in that extra energy due to the fact that our temperature is bigger than zero. <coughs> well, we understand, I hope, from uh, the last course you did with Professor Whitehead, that statistical mechanics can connect these macroscopic kinetic properties with the microscopic <coughs> energy levels of a molecule. So I can look at the individual energy levels of a molecule, some of which are rotational, some of which are vibrational, and some of which are translational, and the sum average of those, sum on su sum average of those energy levels is where our molecule is, and that is at finite temperature T. And again, it will go through every different species on the chemical reaction, and it will follow somewhere above, following all in somewhere in in those excited energy levels. It'll have excited, it'll have vibrational energy, translational energy and rotational energy according to its temperature. So, I hope now you can start to appreciate where this course is going to go. We're actually going to go, within about four lectures, we're going to look at this picture in a lot more detail. We're going to take your knowledge of statistical mechanics, i.e. how do we take energy levels and convert those into some form of energy of a molecule, and how do we then follow that as a kinetic energy, as a kinetic reaction. And when you do that, and you join that up with something called transition state theory, which you learnt in first year, you get what's called the Eyring equation. The Eyring equation gives you the rate constant for a chemical reaction. And that rate constant can be written in terms of all of these partition functions that you all learnt about last semester. And that's where we're going to go into about fourth, the fourth lecture so the next few lectures are going to guide us towards understanding that equation, the Eyring equation, and how you might solve the Eyring equation, how you might use the Eyring equation. But it's all based upon this idea that vibrational energy, translational energy, and rotational energy are, can be added to our potential energy surface. In fact, what you'll find is you only need to know anything about the molecule uh, the reactants and the transition state. To do kinetics, that's all you need the information for. You only need these two distinct states. You need to know about the reactants and you need to know about the transition state. 
So, where, how are we going to learn about these the reactants and the transition state in a more formal way? What did we learn last year? Well, here's a diagram from last year. A multi-dimensional potential energy surface. Yeah, well, there's no, no hardship is this. This is very, very easy. Very simple. What does this multi-dimensional potential energy surface mean for you this year? Well, what it means is you know that there is a potential energy of the molecule. Good. And this potential energy surface, again, this is our Born-Oppenheimer adiabatic potential energy surface. Nice and continuous. That's the energy of the electrons in the molecule. There it is in, in brown. And it will go from reactants through a transition state through to products. And we learned last year that along that route, the reactants will always be at the bottom of a well, will always be in a minimum. And they must be in a minimum for every single coordinate of a molecule. Now we're going to revise that in a second. You're all aware that there are three n minus six coordinates in a molecule. There, uh, so that means that the energy must be at, at a minimum, must be the lowest possible energy with respect to the change in any of those coordinates. So it doesn't matter which bond length I choose, which bond angle I choose, if I stretch a bond, squeeze a bond, open up an angle, the energy must go up if it's a reactant. Because that's what the, the, it says. If I'm there, if I change any coordinate, I must go up in terms of potential energy. The exception to that is the transition state. The transition state is a complicated little beast because it says one coordinate. I'm not going to tell you what coordinate it is. It's called the reaction coordinate. One coordinate means that if I change the molecule along that coordinate, the energy will actually go down. If I change the coordinate in the left-hand direction, I will go down towards reactants. If I change the nuclei and follow the coordinate in the other direction, then I will go to products. So this is implying that on the potential energy surface of the reaction coordinate, I must be at a maximum. There I am. I'm at a maximum there. I'm at a maximum. However, my molecule has 3n minus 6 coordinates. So if I've already described one of them, there must be another 3n minus 7 of them. And my transition state and my reactant and my product must all be minimum with respect to all those other coordinates. And that's why I tend to draw this idea if I just try to emphasize this, that with respect to any other bond length, bond angle, anything else in the molecule, they are at an equilibrium. They are at their lowest energy state. It's only a maximum along one coordinate alone here. That's the definition of our transition state, and it's extremely important. And it, therefore, it's extremely difficult to find. I know there are some of you I recognised who are doing a group project in this area, and I think you will attest to how bloody difficult it is to find these things, isn't it? Yes? Yes, we've got some nods. Very difficult to find this point. If you're trying to understand the kinetics of a chemical reaction, you've got to find something that's very difficult, very unique in, in molecular space. So, now let's just think about what I'm, I'm trying to convey in the, the rest of in this course. We're talking about energies in this course. We're talking about during a chemical reaction, going from reactants to products, how do these reactions occur? Where does energy go from and to? In the next le uh, lecture, we're going to be talking about how do you convert translational energy, <coughs> molecules going bang, into getting over this barrier. How do you go over this barrier by converting collision energy, essentially, into what must be going up the energy scale, going up into higher and higher vibrational energies? We're going to talk about this exchange of energy. How does energy get transferred? How does energy uh, affect this diagram? But the main thing that we need to realise is that there are going to be, we're going to have to consider the energy with respect to a reaction coordinate and separately we're going to have to consider the energy 
with respect to all the other coordinates in the molecule which are nicely relaxed. And this is where the difficulty of the ironing equation is going to come out. You'll see it develop as you come along. I'm trying to, don't, don't worry if you don't understand it right this second. It's, it's a concept that develops gradually. I, I know from experience it takes you a number of times to see it, to understand that these two concepts, the reaction coordinates and these rest of the coordinates of the molecule, the energy in these coordinates, has to be treated separately. And one will convert into the other. So, let's progress. Simple stuff, revision. Just to make sure you're on the same length, wavelength as me. 3n minus 6 coordinates, 3n minus 7 coordinates. Let's have a look at the HCl molecule. This is really, hopefully, nice and gentle for your first day back. What do we need to know? Well, we can describe a molecule in terms of x, y, and z spatial coordinates. x, y, and z spatial coordinates, which means that the high HCl will have three times the number of atoms. N is the number of atoms, N atoms. There'll be three N of them. There'll be an X, a Y, and a Z for every atom. Now, what the next page says is that if, but we all know, we already know that if we were to draw the potential energy surface for the HCl molecule, you would all, I hope, plot the potential energy against R. And you would go, oh, well, I can draw that. That's the potential energy surface for HCl. Because I know HCl only has one coordinate. R, the distance between the two atoms. It only has one internal coordinate. It, in fact, has 3n minus 5 coordinates because it's linear. But that's only because we're, we're just a little bit complicated because of the linearity. But there are essentially 3n minus 6 coordinates of which the two uh, rotations are the same. We know there's only one. Why is that important to us? And here's a technical term, a technical term I didn't use last year, one called rotational and translational invariance. What does this mean? And this is really uh, a term that often gets used in, in uh, physical chemistry, and it's saying that we must remember that a molecule that has three n Cartesian coordinates, well, we can translate that molecule. That is one of those coordinates. One of the co three n coordinates might be an x coordinate of, of all of the atoms, and we could translate the molecule and add one angstrom to every coordinate. We could translate it in the x direction. Does that molecule have the same energy as it did when it was at the origin? Yes. Yeah? Just moving the atom in space, the molecule in space doesn't change the energy. Moving it in the y direction, does it change the energy? No. Does it move, change the energy if you move it in the z direction? No. So each of these translations means that the molecule has the same energy. Three rotations. If I rotate it about the x-axis, does it change its energy? No. If you rotate it about the z or the other axes, no. So there are six different coordinates as part of those 3n coordinates, which means that the energy doesn't change. And this is given the fancy term rotational and translational invariance. What it's saying is that there must be, there are six coordinates out of those 3n that do not change the energy. In other words, the energy depends upon 3n minus six coordinates. And that's all you need to really take away from this. <laughs> is that the energy, potential energy, depends on 3n minus 6 degrees of freedom. So there are going to be 3n minus 6 different ways in which we're going to partition the energy in this molecule. That's the easy thing. What else can we say? This is all revision. I'm just trying to, to, to cover our basis so that we can all go away and come back next time. I don't know why I put this one in, because I think this is really getting a bit, a bit too basic, perhaps. But I like to start slowly. 
potential energy surface. Now, a lot of what you're going to come across in this course are going to be real molecules are anharmonic. Real molecules have potential energy surfaces which are anharmonic, <coughs> the blue curve. As I stretch a molecule, we all know that the energy is not the same as if I squeeze a molecule. But what we need to know for this course is that down here, in this bottom region, down in the lower energy region where adiabatic chemical reactions occur, in fact, a harmonic approximation is extremely good. A harmonic approximation simply says that the potential energy is proportional to delta R squared, the change in the coordinate squared. So as I stretch a molecule, the energy goes up as that stretched coordinate squared. It's expressed as Hooke's law. That's very nice <coughs> and, and easy. So that's the other thing we need to know. I'm going to stop, uh, use, stop at that, that point there. We'll come back to that a bit later on when we think about potential energy surfaces. We need to realize that all of the stuff we're going to do in this course is going to be harmonic. We're going to assume harmonic wave functions. We're going to assume harmonic vibrations. So all of the equations that you learned last semester in, in statistical mechanics with Professor Whitehead, where he taught you about the vibrational partition function in terms of a harmonic expansions, then that's what you're going to have to know for this course. <coughs> and that's why. Right, what's next? Well, potential energy surfaces. Here comes the, the, the good stuff. What did we learn last year? Water molecule, OHH. Are we all happy? that the water molecule has three coordinates that change the energy, and only three. I can choose those three coordinates, and it's convenient to choose a bond distance R here, a bond distance R here, or I can choose an angle and bend the molecule here. So I can have red, blue, or green coordinates. I can stretch it, I can stretch it in a different way, or I can bend it. And that's where we start to have to worry about the shape of the potential energy surfaces. Now, with respect to a bend and a, a stretching coordinate, we're going to have uh, we're going to have that an anharmonic shape normally. We're going to approximate it by a harmonic shape. But what about with respect to the to all these other coordinates? What about this is, could be a delta r? And this could be delta alpha the, uh, uh, shape. We're going to end up with multi-dimensional potential energy surfaces. <coughs> so with, uh, at its equilibrium distance, the water molecule will have a potential energy surface, which is a minimum with respect to delta alpha, <coughs> and it will have a minimum with respect to delta R. Let me see if I can get that right. Yeah, that's there. So I can look at the symmetric C2V structure of water and I can represent its potential energy surface as a two-dimensional potential energy surface. One coordinate is to stretch the OH bond. That's this coordinate along here, the red direction. And the other coordinate is to bend it, change the angle between it, and that changes it along that direction. Of course, water has two stretches, so I really have to add another dimension to this, where I have another stretch, a separate stretch, which becomes rather difficult to draw. So we can represent one-dimensional structures very easily, but when we get into multi-dimensional structures, we have to consider the potential energy surface of every coordinate individually. And it's going to get to a stage where we have more than two coordinates that we can no longer draw the picture and we have to start using the mathematical formulae. Revision from last year. 
So if I can represent my structure here of my potential energy surface of water, which was a minimum in that direction and a minimum in this direction, what does that look like on the, a two-dimensional potential energy surface? So I've said that this is delta alpha and this is delta r. That's what we've just done. If I'm going to draw that as a contour plot, it is going to look like this, this system here. It's going to have a series of concentric circles and right in the middle there is going to be a point which is the minimum. So what is important for you to take away and remember and go back to your notes last year if you can't understand? What's important is that we can describe each coordinate separately as a, as a, a one-dimensional well in its own right. But when we put them together, we're going to have trouble drawing these <coughs> pictures. But we can represent them as a contour picture. And if we look at the contours, as we go outwards from the center of our contour picture in any direction, so if I go out that way, or I go out that way, or I go out that way, or that way, it gives us an increase in the energy. So, and that is shown by contours of ever, of circles, concentric circles. So this diagram here where we have these concentric circles is saying that in the middle, middle, middle we have the lowest energy, but as we go further and further out, the energy goes up and up and up. It goes higher and higher and higher. It follows higher and higher and higher. So we have to understand that we can draw a three-dimensional picture and we can reduce our picture down to two dimensions. We also did that for a transition state last year. So here's a transition state of a molecule, and I've shown two different coordinates. I have so shown a coordinate, which is the reaction coordinate. <coughs> and as we look, we're talking about a little bit earlier, the energy will go up and down as we go from reactants to products. But if we look at other coordinates, if we look at all other coordinates, the energy is at a minimum because they're right in the middle of our picture here. This there we go, in the middle there, is a the transition state. And I want you to note the difference between the two-dimensional contours that you expect for a minimum and the two-dimensional contours that you will get at this transition state structure. Now last year, I know a lot of you found this very difficult to take in in the first attempt. Hopefully by the exam, a lot of you showed you had taken it in. I, can, I, what, I think what particularly got me at the end of last year's course was Nobody really, well, people perhaps didn't appreciate my advice to you. This is the sort of thing I believe I can't teach you. I think you have to stare at this. You have to stare at these diagrams. And you have to ask questions. Then you have to ask questions about what are we trying to say. I cannot teach you that that's what it looks like and that's what I can put it up on the board. But now you have to go away and you have to stare at that until you can see why do I get these circles if my sh surface is shaped like a bowl. Why do I get these contours if my surface is shaped like a saddle? You have to stare at this picture. You have to stare at it and think. I know a lot of you didn't do geography. I don't think that matters. Think about the three-dimensionality of it. It's essential that we know this, that we get the idea of this picture because next, in the, ne in the next lecture, I'm going to start off and we're going to go and we're going to look at this picture. Do you remember this picture? Yes. 
And this picture is where we're going to start. Because what we're going to do for this course, which is different from last year, is we're going to use that picture and we're going to ask ourselves what happens when we vibrationally excite molecules. What happens when we rotationally excite molecules? What path do we take on this surface? What trajectory do we take on that surface that depicts what's going on? Okay, so please, if you have any trouble with anything you've seen today, office hour is now at four o'clock after the lecture, please come and talk to me. I'll talk to anybody. We've got to get this understood. Okay.